evening to you. God bless you and welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. It's so very good to gather with you in our Father's name, in his sanctuary to study his word. May he give us the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding that we need to carry his truth forward in these crucial times, known as the last days. Let us approach his throne. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the opportunity of gathering in thy name, Father. And we seek and we ask, Father, and we ask for food for the hour. We ask for it in the precious name of Yahshua, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The book of Esther. Esther, in the Hebrew tongue, Esther, means a star, or a bright star, even, if you would. Now, a... Most rabbis, and I'm not going to say most rabbis, but many rabbis say that it is Ishtar, which means hidden. Means hidden in the um, Hebrew tongue. There are some facts concerning Esther that you need be aware of. I do not encourage looking into and asking the question as to checking the credentials of a certain set of scriptures as to whether it should have been canonized or not. Uh, in the first place, most people do not like to study to that depth that in some cases it can create doubt concerning certain valid books. But this is one book that we are certainly going to question as to why it was added to the canon in the, at the meeting of Trent. Not until. The Kenites would have you believe that it was added during the great synagogue. That's not true. It absolutely was not. And naturally you must remember that the Nethanim, that is to say the Kenites that had become the scribes for Israel, had a strong place in, if you would, scribeship at this time. Your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, made it very clear when he stated that the scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Now, let's, let's talk about Esther just a moment. Inasmuch as it was not a part of the canon until that time, let me, uh, let, let's, let's just consider some things about Esther. Esther is not mentioned anywhere in the canon. That means nowhere in God's Word do you find Esther mentioned other than Mordecai's own report, where he's blowing his own horn, so to speak, for he is the author. Many would have you believe Ezra was the author, but I tell you, no way can you take the Persian terminology that is used in the book of Esther and tag that on Ezra. Mordecai was very efficient. There are a few Chaldeic or Assyric terms used that are specific, very perfect, and uh, it's uh, just, I mean, to the letter. A very experienced scribe and going into such detail as to the presence of who was present in a certain bedroom or chamber naming each individual to the point that either it was connived or he was there. Ezra was not. For Ezra never mentions Esther. Daniel, the great prophet, never mentions Esther, and he was even in Susa, the palace that this so-called queen was supposed to uh, inhabit. Nowhere did Daniel mention this Esther and Mordecai. It would seem strange that we would have a hero in Mordecai and, and a woman with such great magnitude that it saved Israel, and Daniel wouldn't mention it, especially that Nehemiah wouldn't mention it. They certainly weren't very respectful to her, were they? Okay. Most of all, Yahshua, Jesus the Christ, never acknowledged Esther, nor has any Christian apostle ever celebrated that time known as Purim. It is not legal, and God did not give. Even Mordecai himself is wise enough that he said, Esther and I wrote it. Not that it was the Word of God, you see. This will, we will prove this out as we go. Now, 
this would be well that it was not mentioned in the Scripture, you might say, well, they were partial. But you see, there's another great thing also. You would think that Xerxes or Ahasuerus, when they recorded their wives, if he had such a gallant one and beautiful one as this, certainly she would be a part of history. Nowhere in Babylonian, Persian, me, history, is there an Esther mentioned and or recorded or ever existed. Now, really, when we use just a little common sense, we begin to realize, hey, there's some holes in this that uh, you can drive a Mack truck through, you see. And we've only started, my dear friend. If a woman had practically sacrificed herself to deliver Israel, then Jesus Christ would have mentioned her or one of the apostles somewhere. Beyond a doubt, you see. Now, there is another very strange thing about this whole affair. The emancipation had already taken place. Israel had been freed at the time of Esther. There was no need for Israel to hide. Ezra had already taken one group or was given permission to take one group back, go with our blessings. And you must remember that when the Persians took over, that the Persians were an Aryan people worshiping one God. That means they were kinsmen. That is to say, of Adam. They were like people. They were not of Nebuchadnezzar and his uh, crowd. So they were released. They were freed. So why would Esther have to hide herself? Ishtar, meaning the hidden, you see. Well, that, that's a good question. <clears throat> now let's take Mordecai and his credentials. Mordecai's genealogy will not hold up, number one. And a few rabbis that thought a Christian scholar that might come along and be wise enough to know we would have had to have dug someone up to cause a birth to take place, then they had to make something stretch. You know, like they tell someone on camera, stretch it a while, all right? But this is, then the rabbis have almost made a Messiah out of Mordecai. Let me, let me just read to you, and I'm reading uh, from the, the Talmud, so to speak, okay? This, rabbis claim Mordecai knew all 70 language Languages of all language of all the nations mentioned in Genesis chapter 10. Okay. You know, that would take quite a mind, you see. Which the rabbis count as 70 nations. And that his age exceeded 400 years. You will find this documented in the rabbinical liber um, literate, volume 1, page 179. Now, beloved, let me ask you, when we have to make up stories to that magnitude to make his genealogy and this book reach, that's stretching the point just a little bit. But there you will find it in volume one on page 179. Now, it is written, and even in our companion Bible, that Esther was the mother of Cyrus. Say, that really, you know, that just really makes the book almost believable if you would believe that lie, you see. Because Cyrus was one of three that God, Yahweh, the Almighty, named before birth. But you see, was Esther the mother of Cyrus? Absolutely not. A woman named Mendane the daughter of Astaages, the last king of Media, was the mother of Cyrus, and it is well recorded. It is history. It is written. It is logged. Is Esther, much less as being the mother of Cyrus, she is not found in history. Not only Israelite history, but neither is she found in Babylonian history, Persian history, or the history of the Medes. Now, Esther is and was accepted by the Nephinim. 
from the great synagogue. Now, you can go into the Talmud and they will tell you that it was canonized there, that it was, you know, but who do you listen to or who do you study under? Kenites? Danger. The Kenites, that is to say, but not until the Council of Trent pronounced the whole book of Esther to be canonical, and Batablus says that prior to that decision, it was doubtful whether or no Esther was to be included even in the canon. It was a fairy tale. Any scholar, you know, can tell, you know, with, with this, that we're, we're talking about a book of fiction. God's name is not mentioned anywhere in the manuscripts of the book of Esther, but it is hidden five times. Now, that's why I'll go along with the book being called Ishtar the Hidden. For God himself allowed Esther to be brought forth whereby um, the people would know that... Um, his hand was upon it. But what are you to learn from it? One simple fact. The people that worship this holy day, their holy day, not ours, never worshipped by Christians or practiced, nor were we instructed by Christ to do so. Um, then only those that were supposed to, that leaves only one set, one group, Mordecai's people, the Kenites. Okay, there, let's talk about Purim a minute, and I'm going to read a passage. There is some doubt about the origin of the festival as indicated in Esther. It is taught by many that the festival was originally a pagan feast. Persian or Babylonian or Greek of the new year or of the dead or the vintage, meaning the harvest, which had been adopted by Jews and had become so firmly established, this would be during the captivity, that it could not be abolished. For the Jew, it could have no clearly religious significance, but was rather of a merely social character and was marked by much merrymaking and even access. It was, however, given a patriotic and a national character by being transformed into an annual ceremonial of the great deliverance described in the book of Esther and in the book of Esther only, not described in history, which was ordered to be read at the feast. By who? The rabbis. Okay. Some would maintain that Mordecai and Esther are really disguised forms of the names of the Babylonian deities Murdoch and Ishtar. One rabbi even calls her Ishtar. Uh, Mordecai's day, which the day of Purim is called by so many, uh, being originally Murdoch's day, some old Babylonian myth had been transformed into a story of national heroes with a patriotic theme. Such suggestions are of great interest and some of great ingenuity but they remain entirely in the realm of theory, and theory only, I remind you. If the origin of the feast, as described in Esther, is doubtful, no alternative theory so far produced is very convincing, unless you want to call it an out-and-out -out lie. Okay? Let's look at the historical value. It will be seen from the last paragraph, that's the one we just stated, that considerable doubt has been thrown upon the case of the history of Esther. Some would deny the story any kind of historical background and regard it merely as a transformed pagan myth. Others would be prepared to maintain that there may be some real historical event underlying the story. Well, find it for me in history then, okay? Uh, but that it has been much embellished by the romantic imagination of the writer. Attempts have been made to defend its full historical accuracy, but they cannot be regarded as successful. And I swear to you, this is true. They cannot be successful in historically establishing 
Esther, it must be confessed that the book abounds in improbabilities and exaggerations and bears the stamp of an imaginative romance. The writer probably knew Persia sufficiently well to give the story a thoroughly Persian coloring, and it does have. That's why it is, uh, that is why you must remove Ezra as an author. But um, secular, history, secular history knows nothing of his heroes, Mordecai and Esther, nor of any queens of Xerxes named Vashti. She doesn't exist in history either. No queen Vashti. If Mordecai was one of the exiles carried to Babylon in 597 B.C., which it is recorded he was, he must have been about 120 years old in the reign of Xerxes. This would make our beautiful queen also somewhere between 100 and 120 years old. Now really, I ask you, um, it won't work. There are holes in it. But I suppose that the father left the holes so big because we are so slow seeing sometimes. Now with this background in mind, let us see if we can decipher what the father would have us retrieve or learn from this book of Esther. He definitely, our father definitely intended this book to be in the Bible, whereby you can brand your enemy the liar and have him spotted even down to his feast days throughout all times, even yes to this day. The book of Esther, chapter 1 and verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this is Ahasuerus which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces. Now Daniel reported this as a hundred and twenty, I believe it was, provinces in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 1. But he failed to mention Esther. Okay? That in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace. Now I want you to make a note there of Daniel chapter 8, and let's say verses 1 through 3. And I want you to read what happened in Daniel, for he was also in this palace at Shushan. As a matter of fact, it was here where he was gave, given the great vision of the big he-goat prancing to and fro, and charging the ram. And I feel that what the Father would have you know is that this is the origin of the he-goat, is Mordecai's people, whereby you could be forewarned. But did Daniel, this most impressive queen, and this great eunuch named Mordecai, did Daniel even take one breath to say, I uh, was in confederacy with them, I loved them, they helped me, I helped them? It's drier than a boneyard. He didn't mention them. Okay, verse 3. And in the third year of his reign, he made a fast unto all his, a feast rather, unto all his princes and his servants. The power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. And when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom, and indeed he was a rich man, um, the honor of his excellent majesty, Majesty, many days, even in hundred and fourscore days. That's over six months, beloved. They, they were partying, okay? Really having a feast. They were living it up, okay? And when these days were expired, that is when this time was over, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. Now, I mean, you would think that inasmuch as Daniel was one of the favorites and was so blessed, he would have been invited also, wouldn't you? Especially if he was at Shushan. Poor old Daniel didn't get a ticket, say. Because probably this affair never took place. But you must understand it is a story that has a meaning, so become involved in it. Okay? It has a meaning. Verse 6. Where were uh, white and green and blue hangings, fastening, fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble, 
The beds were of gold and silver and upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. Woo-wee! Now you talk about a fancy place. Now they, they had it, all right? No doubt. Probably a few Persian carpets, and it was right downtown, okay? Verse 7. And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another. I mean golden vessels with not one looking alike. And royal wine in abundance, uh, according to the state of the king. Let's read verse 8 because it declares what the state of the king is. And the drinking, or the laws concerning drinking, was according to the law. Okay. None did compel, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. In other words, we're going to take a seven-day thing here. We're going to live it up. If you want to drink, you drink whatever you can handle, and then some if you so feel impelled. And if you don't want to drink, don't drink. So I want you to see what kind of affair is going on here, okay? Uh, and, of course, I would have you remember at the same time in Jeremiah chapter 35, the Kenite, when invited in, would not drink. And as a matter of fact, in the, in the addition that some rabbi even added to these Hebrew books that are in the canon now, some Greek chapters to Esther, Esther said, I didn't drink wine at Haman's table, you see. That thumbprint for the scholar to be aware of and to know. Okay, now let's get into a little bit of history here, if we may. Verse 9, And Vastai, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Well, now, we certainly in history have a King Ahasuerus. It's a title. It's usually thought of by most scholars as Xerxes. It doesn't really matter, you see. But do you know something? Never in history of Vastai. The wives, the main, the head wives are recorded. Now, if she was the most beautiful and his favorite, and he, you know, then why wasn't she recorded? It is very simple. She doesn't and never has existed, except in the figment of someone's mind. Okay, verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry, that means he was drunk, with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bista, and Harbana, Bigta, and Abaka, Zetar, and Karkas, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king. He talked to these seven. The king to bring Vestai, the queen, before the king with the crown royal and to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look upon. All right. Now, I want you to see the picture. Here we've had a drunk going on for seven days. Now, I'm going to put it in a language we can all understand, okay? And he sends word to his wife, get yourself out here with your pretties on and let the boys have a look, okay? She wasn't happy about it, okay? She didn't appreciate it. Now, if you can imagine... What a place that it had a drunk going on for seven days. You know, one night's pretty tough sometimes, you see. I wouldn't know, but now I've heard people talk, you see. That, that's salty enough, but seven days, wow. You know, things can just almost totally get out of hand in a seven-day period. Well, let's see what she does here. Verse 12, But the Queen Vasta refused to come at the king's commandment. But by his chamberlains, Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Now, I know some scholars say that he was supposed to send nobility after her, but that, that won't hold either, okay? 13, she just didn't want to go before that crowd. Verse 13, And then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. In other words, he always looked for his advice, uh, and then, and the next unto him was Karshina. Now, I, I'll tell you what. As I go through here, I'm going to tell you, if I may, in Persian and Hebrew, as it applies here, what the meaning of these names are, because I'm going to tell you what. These boys, when, when Mordecai dreamed this up, he put nobility into it. I mean, these are heavy, okay? Uh, Karshina means 
illustrous. All right? This is old illustrous. And Shetar, that's like Ishtar, it's a star, okay? Old the shining one, okay? And Adnatha, that means given by the highest, okay? Uh, Tarshish, meaning established. And Miras, meaning lofty. And Marcina, being worthy. And the, the, the popular one and the one that was used most by Ahasuerus, Mimukan, which means dignified. And you've got to dignify the story if you expect people to believe it. So we let the dignified hang on the end here. The seven princes of Persia and Media, which uh, saw the king's face, or is in his friends there, and which set the first in the kingdom. In other words, these were your top dogs in Mordecai's trumped up kingdom here because, you know, you can look in Ahasuerus' history and you'll find all these great names missing. They, they weren't his advisors. But according to Mordecai, and I think probably that's a phrase maybe we should start using, according to Mordecai, uh, verse 15, What shall we do unto the Queen Vesta according to the law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of, the, of King Ahasuerus by the chamberlain. She refused. Now what, what they're really about to do here is say, Hey, if this word gets around that his wife wouldn't obey him, Ours might get the word around, and they wouldn't obey us. See? Okay? So, verse 16. And Mimukan, this is the dignified one, answered before the king and the prince and princes, Vasta the queen hath not done wrong to the king only. She hadn't only made a fool out of you, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. You've... You've wronged, she's wronged every man in the country, in all provinces. 17, for this deed of the queen shall come abroad upon all women, they're all going to hear it, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes, and when it shall be reported, uh, when it shall be reported. And the king Ahasuerus commanded Vestai, the queen, to be brought in before him, but she came not. In other words, we can't let this word get around. So, as I've stated before, you might have the first challenge of women's rights right here, okay? Verse 18, Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. In other words, they're going to get too hard to get along with. So let's make an example out of her, okay? And here it comes, 19, if it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it may be, uh, that it may um, be not altered, that Vasta came no more, come rather no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. Do you notice anything wrong with that verse? Write it in King Ahasuerus' decrees and laws. Do you know what happens when you read Ahasuerus' laws and commandments? You won't find this, for it's not written there. It's a lie. Okay. Now, the Father, though, has a unique way. In the older manuscripts... There were majestic, majestic, or let, let us say, the lead letter in a Hebrew word was, well, let's just use the term capped, okay? They were in capital letters, which brought the consonants of the sacred name to let you know the Father wanted you to read and understand. In this particular case, it happens to be backward. Uh, in the verse, I'll call it to your attention after we finish the reading, verse 20. And when the king's decree, which he shall make, shall be published throughout all this empire. Now, this wasn't supposed to be just a little local thing. In 120 provinces, this was supposed to be written. Some way or another, it didn't even make it on a wall anywhere. Okay? For it is great. Well, it wasn't great, you see. All the wives shall give to their husbands honor both 
to great and small. Now, I want you to put prins, if you will, in front of all and after give, because that is wherein lies the sacred name. Now, those of you that have companion Bibles, you're very fortunate, for Appendix, Appendix 60 will give you exactly the Hebrew tongue and language that this uh, word appears in. So, um, and for the others, understand that starting with this, you have H-V-H-Y, which is Yahweh backwards, in a sense, because we have a backward story here. And anytime you see the sacred name in reverse, he wants you to know that something is wrong. Okay? 21. And the saying, this is what, I'm sorry, this is what is known as an acrostic. An acrostic. An acrostic means that the verse says a great deal more than is intended or, or that is uh, available to the, to the reader. There is much more intended rather than what is said. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay? Verse 21. And the saying pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mimucan. I might add also, if it were not for that sacred name being hidden in there, I would have no respect whatsoever for this other than simply a Kenite myth that we know that he intends you to get the full value. Okay, 22. For he sent letters unto all the king's provinces, unto every province, uh, according to the writing thereof, and to every people uh, after their language. Is it not strange out of uh, all those different languages that we couldn't find one report in history that every man should bear rule in his own house and that it should be published according to the language of every people? Well, out of 127 provinces, you can't come up with one, you see. So again, we see the myth. I'll tell you what, we're going to do one more chapter tonight in this, uh, and it reads rather fast, and we're going to cover some ground. Most of you are familiar with the story, but let's see how Esther comes into being. Chapter 2, verse 1. After these things, when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vasta. What it means is after he sobered up, he realized what he had done, okay? And, uh, and what she had done and what was decreed against her. And then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. Now he's, he's being remorseful and so forth, but now we're going to get a new king, a queen rather, out of the situation. Verse 3, And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan, the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Higi, and in Hebrew this is Higai, which means simply eunuch. He was the head eunuch. The king's chamber, keeper of the women, and let their things for purification be given him. You place him in charge of them, let's purify them for the king. And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vesta, Vesta, and the thing pleased the king, and he did so. He was quite happy with this. He had, he had got his head probably back down to normal size and, and um, was still allowing the eunuchs to do his thinking for him. Verse 5. Now in, in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. First of all, he's not a Jew, he's a Benjamite. Okay? That's, I mean, it says it right there. He's not of Judah. Okay? But be that as it may, that's not all that unusual. Now then, what does Mordecai mean, though? It means a little man or a worshiper of Mars. Now, isn't that a strange name for a Benjamite to carry, really? You know, I ask you. Okay. Now, number one, if you check the genealogy of these his fathers here, uh, it just doesn't work, all right? Now, the rabbis themselves, this group that thinks that Mordecai could be, oh, maybe even upwards to 800 years old, says that Shimei was one that cursed David. But David didn't kill him. Now, this, this is a speech of a rabbi. Don't, don't bother making a, 
uh, a remembrance of it. It's worthless, all right, it's, as all of the Talmud is. Uh, 800 years old, that this is the one that uh, David cursed, but he didn't kill him because he knew that Esther and Mordecai was going to come forth through his seed. Isn't that wonderful? Okay. Uh, I assure you, if someone had cursed David, they wouldn't have lasted till the sun set. Okay. Now, uh, verse 6. Who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with uh, Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. Now, Jeconiah, in the Hebrew tongue, is Jehoiakim, C-H-I-N, Jehoiakim. All right? That lets you know exactly when these two went into captivity, which would make him, at the time of this writing, somewhere between 120 and 170 years old. That's, that's easily understood, isn't it? I mean, it, it would seem at least that Mordecai could have got it together just a little better. There is, we can change the Hebrew if you like. I mean, some scholars do and say, well, if this, was, if this Hebrew word was placed here first, we could say that he was, these were of his fathers, but this was a Jair that was taken captive, not Mordecai, say. But that isn't what the Hebrew says, say. So that's where the difference, the Hebrew says that Mordecai was carried away, not his father. Okay, so don't let don't let anyone uh, uh, plant false ideas into God's word or into any scripture that is accepted that you are to learn from to make it say something it doesn't. Okay, verse seven, and he brought up Hadasha. This this is Myrtle. That is Esther, and Esther, of course, as we know, means the star or Rabbi Yehuda says that it means that it is Ishtar and it means to hide. And with a rabbi name being Yehuda, you should uh, more or less begin to know we're talking about Kenites is what we're talking about. Okay, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. In other words, he was happy to take her for his own daughter. Number one, Mordecai, you must understand, would have to be a eunuch before he could uh, visit all the places that he is able to. That is to say, stand in the king's gate, have the favor with the other eunuchs, etc., etc., okay? Eight, so it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan, the palace, to the custody of Hegai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house, to the custody of Hegai, keeper of the women. This simply, as I said earlier, means eunuch. And the maiden pleased him. This maiden even pleased this old eunuch, see. And she obtained kindness of him. And he speedily gave her things for purification with such things as belonged to her. And seven maidens, which were meant me to be given her, out of the king's house, and he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. So you see, this old eunuch fixes Esther up right quick like. So, so we should begin to see what type of person and influence that Mordecai and Esther were able to command. Ten. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. Now, like I said, the, um, the uh, emancipation had already taken place. Why would he want to hide it? You see. It wasn't necessary. They were people, they were all Aryans. Unless she happened to be a Kenite. And actually, that wouldn't work. And that would have to remain hidden. Verse 11, And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Now, as I stated before, according to Persian law, or almost any law of any land, a man could not walk in the court of the women except he or else he were a eunuch. They were the only people that were allowed near the women of the king. 
So we see here that he has set himself up in this capacity. Verse 12. Now when every maid's turn was come to go in to the king of Hazareth, after uh, that uh, she had been twelve months according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished, to wit six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. Now, uh, here we, unfortunately, we've chalked up another year on Esther. And I don't know, let's say if she was 120, that'd only be 121, so that's not too bad, right? Okay, 13. Then thus came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. Now, I want you to see how Esther thought supposedly. In the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women to the custody of Sheazgaz, this is servant of the beautiful is what it means, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines, and she came in into the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. In other words, they went to the second house, and they never got out of that house unless by request. So Esther didn't want to miss her opportunity. Look at the way she handles it. Verse 15. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, Abihel being the father of possessing, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king. Did she make her own mind up? No, she required nothing but what he got the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women appointed, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. In other words, she said, Hey, guy, you know the king. You know his taste. You know his likes. I want you to tell me exactly what I should wear, what I should take with me, what I should do to please him. So is it any wonder that she found favor? Verse 16 so Esther was taken un, unto King Ahasuerus, unto his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. There's an interesting thing. I, I mentioned dates earlier about the he-goat, and you know that the he-goat that I mentioned uh, in chapter 1 happened in 70, uh, was it 73, 70, um, uh, 1973 and 4. That's when Nixon was driven from office. Then according to the time that the city was smitten, and I'm just mentioning this in passing, this would have been 1977, December. Do you remember what happened in December of 1977? Sadat, Begin, and uh, met and began the great Babylon of the last day. That's peace talks that continue on. Okay, verse 17. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vesta. And in chapter 2, in verse 18, but with comment on 17. Now hold it a minute. He set the crown royal on her head, number one wife. Is it strange that this great thing never came to pass that it isn't written in history. But it isn't. Because again, it didn't happen. Verse 18, And then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast. And he made a release to the provinces and he gave gifts according to the state of the king. He was throwing a real wing ding is what he was doing. See, but again, not important enough to be written about or recorded. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Boy, he was moving in. Okay? Moving right in. Now, he gives you a, a perfect way that the Kenite operates. If you, want to, if you really want to place the Nethanim in the place of Mordecai, you've got how it works. Okay? This is the way they operate. Uh, verse 20. Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. Where was her loyalty? 
Her loyalty certainly was not to her husband, but to her uncle, old Mordecai, even down to her race. And I would suppose that if I were a Kenite, I might not want people to know about it either. Okay? Verse 21. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigtan, that's the gift of God, and Tirush, um, of, of those who, which kept the door, were wroth, and they sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. They were, they were going to kill him, is what it means. They were plotting. And the thing was known to Mordecai, you bet, his little old ears was on every keyhole, okay, uh, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Esther's name? No, never, in little old Mordecai's name, okay? Verse 23, And then uh, inquisition was made of the matter, and it was found out, therefore they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Was it? It's not written. Never is it written that Mordecai or Esther, either one, in the Chronicle of the Kings, saved this great king Ahasuerus. You would think that it would have been worth mentioning. But no, it wasn't worth mentioning, for it isn't written at all. I hope that it does not sound that I am uh, overemphasizing or building a case to a point that it would seem like too much of an overkill. But you see, beloved, this book has deceived our people for so many years that when I see the Kenites deceive or in the act of deceiving our people, especially from the Word of God, and, of course, as it is written, so it is. It was meant to be. But we see from the Nephinim, and they're taking over in Ezra and Nehemiah, which were written in this same period, uh, time, as well as the book of Daniel. Those four, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and Daniel. There's even a couple of the other minor prophets. All in the same time period. You would think that one of them would have thought enough of our dear little 121-year-old darling uh, to have mentioned her at least. But I suppose they felt she wasn't worth it. Or maybe it was that she didn't exist. Okay? So be that as it may, um, it's, it is important though, that you understand what she accomplished after this for she becomes the Jezebel. And that is happening to your people today, what she pulled upon these people of this day. You will see many more of these instances where it should have been written. But the great miracle of miracles, there's no record. You see. So in God's word, he would have you know how the Kenite came into power and deceived your people. Beloved, you're reading it now. That's why it's important. Let us approach his throne. Y'all be dear Heavenly Father. Father, we thank you, Father, for this record where the Nephinim that had worked in, Father, show their colors, Father. And what a challenge to our people, Father. Father, we ask and pray for knowledge and wisdom and understanding, Father, into the miracles, Father, of thy scriptures, how perfect they are. We ask this in the precious name of Yahshua, Jesus the Christ. Amen.